I got an appointment the next morning and the doctor was looking into my eye. I, have, I, had, I didn't have any pain, but I, I wasn't seeing clearly. I wasn't sure what was going on. And he looked at me and it was kind of silence. And then he said, you have a very rare eye disease. You have to go to the ER right now. Hi, and welcome to my first episode. I wanted to spend a few minutes and kind of explain what this podcast is all about and how this first episode is going to be a bit different than the regular format. So this podcast is going to be focused on real estate investing stories. And the idea was to find the most fascinating and interesting real estate investors and have them share an anecdote a really interesting story about a certain situation or investing um, anything that is related to real estate you know I also believe that stories are a lot more memorable it's a great way to actually remember certain key points and certain takeaways that you can actually implement in your own real estate investing people don't remember facts they remember stories so that's why I think This is going to be a great episode and a great podcast. Well, actually, this episode is going to be a little bit different because it's about my own story. It's about my life story. I really wanted to share the story. I wanted you to know who I am and where I come from and what motivates me. And I think that's going to add a lot of depth to the podcast. If you understand who I am and... um, you know, why I'm so fascinated with real estate and why I have such a burning desire to succeed and excel in life. So in this episode, I asked my friend Max to interview me. So he's a, a fellow a podcaster. And in this episode, you're going to hear about rough childhood, about challenging marriage and, you know, an undying desire to succeed. And I'm sharing this story because I really hope to inspire people. I really hope that some people can find strength and courage um, and they can, you know, maybe even relate to to what I'm sharing. And I have a little bit, I, I have a little confession to make. Um, what you're hearing is not 100% of what happened. And what I mean by that is that everything that I say is accurate, but I left some things out that I thought would be a little too personal and maybe too painful to share. And, you know, maybe if you reach out to me and uh, we meet for a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, I might share the entire story. But I think even with what I was feeling comfortable sharing, I think that that would really give you a a good understanding of who I am and I think that can still inspire people who are in tough situations and the main takeaway from my life story without revealing too much at this point is that it doesn't matter what life hands you it doesn't matter what cards you have where you were born and and to what reality what matters is that what you decide and how you see yourself and I truly believe that thoughts create reality if you're convinced that you're worth it that you can go somewhere and that you can lift yourself up from a a really really bad situation you can absolutely do it looking at my life story I wasn't even supposed to be here I wasn't supposed to invest in real estate or start my own company I was supposed to be in a very, very different place right now, but I decided that that's not, that's not going to happen. I was convinced that I was able to do a lot more and that's exactly what happened. What you have in your mind is what's going to happen. You create your own reality. Nobody else can do it for you. So I hope you're going to enjoy my story and find it interesting and inspiring. Hi, you're listening to That Really Happened, Unbelievable Real Estate Stories. I'm your host, Ellie Perlman. If you're a real estate investor, this is the podcast for you. Our guest speakers will bring you amazing, intriguing, and unbelievable stories about real estate investing. The stories will be an honest and transparent account 
about what it actually means to invest in real estate. You'll hear stories that investors don't usually share. Stories about hardships, breaking points, painful truths, and surprising realizations. Sometimes there's a happy ending, and sometimes the story ends very differently than you would expect. So let's get the show started. So let's get into it. I'm, yeah. I'm excited. I know this is going to be for me the second time to hear, you know, kind of your story again. But, you know, going back to, uh, you're from Israel, right? Yeah, that's right. I was born in Israel. Um, actually, I came from uh, a very, very small I wouldn't call it a village, but it, it was a very, very small um, place on top of a mountain. Um, when my parents moved there when I was about, I think it was five or six, there were only 20 or 25 families living there. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, no supermarket or nothing. I mean, there was nothing much besides a bunch of families gathering together and starting, like, you know, going and deciding hey, we're going to live in this mountain. And then when we moved, we didn't even have um, a road. I have actually a childhood memory of my dad um, pushing in one hand my my sister in a stroller. And then uh, with the other hand, he's kind of kind of dragging me uh, on my little bike <laughs> because I couldn't even ride on my bike. There, Everything was just little stones and there was not even a road there. So right. that's, uh, that's crazy. yeah, that's I think my earliest childhood memory. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So 25 families decided to move to a mountain. Yes. That's that's crazy. I mean, do, do you still hear stories? I mean, your parents still tell you stories about like why they did that or like, well, like, um, what was that experience like? And yeah, well, they the reason why they moved was because it was um, it was just cheaper than any other option. And there was actually a raffle to get in because a lot of families wanted to start, you know, just move there. Um, mm. And there was not enough, you know, room for a lot of people. And uh, my parents didn't have a lot of money. So they they've decided to move there because that's the only way that they could actually own a single family home because everything was was really expensive. My mom was a teacher. My dad was also a teacher. And um my mom got sick pretty early on, and so she couldn't work anymore. So money was was very tight, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. that's basically why they moved there. Um, but uh, it was um, it was an interesting childhood. It um, everything was I mean it was such a small community. Everybody knew everyone, and right. if you had a fight with one or two friends, that's it. You're out of friends because that's all you got there. <laughs> And uh, we used to have those silly fights and we used to decide every every week or so, okay, we're not going to talk to this girl because this and this and this. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it was just an interesting, interesting childhood to say the least. Right. If you take yourself back to that time, do you, did you know that you were in a small place? Like, um, not, not really. I didn't really go out of that area much. And that was my entire world until I got much older when I was... Um, I think 14 or 15, we didn't even have a bus. We had, you know, from there to take us anywhere. We had to walk for 20 minutes to get to a bus, uh, you know, a bus station um, outside of, of, of that area. So not really. That, that, okay. That's what well, I knew, basically. Well, crazy. Yeah. You're going to be one of those parents that tells their kids I had to walk 20 minutes to <laughs> get to the nearest bus station. Yeah, <laughs> and if you're, if you're out of milk or anything, you have to actually drive, um, either walk 20 minutes to the bus station and then drive another 20 minutes to the nearest town or just drive. And mm -hmm. when you're out of sugar or an egg, just, you go to the neighbor because you – you're not going to drive all the way, you know, to, to get food. It's, uh, you know, like uh, two eggs or something. It's not, it's, and that's right. why I'm so fascinated with real estate because for me, the convenience of having everything around me is so foreign. Mm. And even now, even, you know, 15, 20 years later, it's, it's still, it's still something that I, that I don't take for granted that I can actually wake up in the morning and, walk to the nearest grocery store, you know, store or, or, you know, right. walk to the beach or all those things that I didn't have. I was living a very, very different life back then. And it leaves a mark on you. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what was the experience like and, and, and kind of the things, yeah, I'm always interested in you know, like our life and especially young childhood shapes us, right? And we absolutely. carry some philosophies and, and ideas in place. And so if you take a look back at that, that childhood, how, what are the, some of the things that you've, you concluded coming out of, you know, the childhood that you had? And if you can expand, and I know your story is a little bit more yeah. expansive than what you're, you're telling me right now, but you know, what was the experience like living in the mountains with, you know, 25 families and, and your parent, your, your mom not being able to work mm-hmm. uh, and your dad being the sole provider? I mean, walk us through that a little bit, a little bit further. Things were, things were tough. Um, the reality was very different. I didn't know that it was a tough reality because that's all I knew. But at some point, mm-hmm. because my, my mom got sicker and sicker and, um, we, it was my, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm the, the oldest. And then we have, uh, I have two sisters and one brother mm-hmm. and my dad was, you know, was out a lot and, um, he would come back late and, uh, during that time, um, I would, we, we would all go to school and then come back. Um, usually my mom would still be in bed. And so I kind of took the role on, you know, of, of the, the caregiver. And so, mm-hmm. you know, making, sometimes we would come back and there was lunch there and sometimes we had to make lunch. Um, so helping my, you know, my siblings with, making food, making sure that they do their homework. So we would all sit down on a table and, and do homework together, um, going out to play, making sure they come back on time. And usually my dad was there for dinner, but sometimes we would make dinner together. Mm-hmm. So that kind of a thing, experience kind of shapes you. And I didn't understand that it was out of the ordinary that I actually sure. took care of my siblings because, and my mom was on the picture because that's all I knew. At some point when I was 11, I... Uh, things were, I think it was 10 or 11, I was really, things got real, really, money was really tight. And then uh, my dad, my parents actually started to clean the synagogue, the local synagogue, to make some, some money. And at some mm. point, I chipped in and I said, hey, you know what, um, I-, I can do that. And I would go there every week or every other week and um, with, you know, my buckets and, and all the... Uh, you know, my broom and everything. I would walk from home. It was a short walk, five minutes. I would kind of struggle to hold everything. I would spend several hours just cleaning there and um, to help my parents make some money. And I would play music and make it, you know, a fun kind of activity. Um, right. And it didn't look, you know, it was, it was fine. It actually, I didn't actually experience that as as a negative experience. It wasn't a negative experience for me. It's all I knew. And you know, what's the difference between cleaning my room and cleaning, right, you know, right. the synagogue. It's the same. My, my brothers, you know, we grew, we grew up and the situation was not at home was not, not getting any better. And mm. at some point, social welfare, the, the, they decided that we belong in the system and they decided to, you know, someone came one day to the house, a lady, and she was walking, looking around she saw my mom, she saw how we were, and she decided that this is not, that we should not stay there because we don't have an adult that can take care of us. Um, and they've decided to find foster families for us and just the the talk was to kind of separate us and have us in four different families. And thankfully, my dad w- was not willing to hear you know, anything like that. And he fought so hard to keep us at home. At some point, because they couldn't provide for us, we, they actually decided um, to send us to boarding schools. So that, Mm. that was kind of the compromise. Okay. You get to keep your kids at home, but they're actually going to come back every other week and um, every other weekend. But I want to kind of, uh, go back a little bit and you know one of the things that actually was part of the complexity of growing there was the fact that it was such a small community that everyone knew everyone and everybody knows right. about everything and um right we used to get bags uh, with clothes that people sent for charity 
And I didn't really understand the concept of, okay, someone wore it once and now it's yours. I just saw, you know, a bunch of clothes and I was excited because we didn't get a lot of chances to, to buy new clothes. Um, sure, sure. It was, I think, once a year for a certain holiday. My mom used to take us all and it was, you know, like a $15 dress or something. And I remember there was one, sh one Mickey Mouse t-shirt that I loved. I still remember the colors, blue and red and, and the huge Mickey right. Mouse you know, face all over it. And I was so excited. I was actually radiating. I, was, I, I loved this, this, uh, this shirt and um, I went to school with it. And then one of the kids pointed on the, on the t-shirt and he, and he said, Hey, that's my t-shirt. Um, that's actually my PJ and I donated this, my PJ to poor people. So you're poor because you're wearing my shirt. And, um, <laughs> that was not, that, that was not a very, that was one of the moments that I still remember, probably will always remember, um, as, mm. and then I understood where I was kind of in the world. Cause that was my world where yeah. I was positioned, right. which was very, very low. So was that the very first time in your memory bank that you realized, like, look, I'm on the poverty end of the social scale? Yeah. Yeah. I, wow. I kind of had my suspicions um, when the whole, when all the talks about sending us to foster families started, kind of realized, okay, this is not a, a usual family. There's something in, is going on. Mm -hmm. um, and when the, the this kid pointed out on the t-shirt that I was wearing and kind of placed me as as the poor, I realized, okay, we are poor. That changed, I think from that moment, it kind of changed how I perceived things at home. I saw it through different eyes. Because um, mm -hmm. I realized this is not normal. This is, we're not like other people. And it really, I didn't quite realize it back then. Um, all the homes were kind of the same. They were man manufactured sure. homes, so I didn't. There was no concept of we we live in a, you know, in a little tiny old crumbling house, and we have this mansion over here. All the houses were the right. same, so it was kind of hard to understand. Right, right. At 15, um, I was sent to a boarding school, and for the for the first time, I was actually exposed to drugs, to alcohol. Um, and uh, exposed because I actually didn't touch any of those things. Um, because in my in my in back of my head, I always had this this reality from where I came from, and I told myself, I'm never gonna go back there um, to that you know poor place. Even though I had no chance, I had no choice but to go back every other weekend. But I, I made a promise to myself, and I said, my future kids will never have that experience. They wouldn't, they're never going to grow poor. They're never going to be where where I was or where I am mm. right now. And I knew that for me through education, I would be able to get out of that place. I didn't under, I didn't know how exactly, I didn't know how am I going to do it, you know, but but I knew that doing drugs or and it was so available around me um or drinking alcohol or doing what everything that the other kids were doing it's definitely not going to get me out of where I am. I'm, I'm curious because uh, one of the, th the thoughts I had for you was like, how did you know, right? I mean, our environment is obviously a very big part of what shapes us, right? And shapes our belief systems and our philosophies in life. How did you, know, like, what caused you to say, like, and know that you were able, you're going to get out of that situation and never, ever return there? Like, was it the pain of of that experience in the Mickey Mouse shirt? Was it some other things that you're like, I want never to experience that again? Like, like tell me, you know, what was the catalyst for your thought process and formulating that belief you had that early? I think when I realized that the welfare system was in the picture and they actually have some sort of power over my parents and they can actually send us elsewhere. Hmm. I realized that I, I have to maintain power on, or, over my life. I can't have anyone else on the outside come and make such a huge decision with something that, f f the way I saw it, they didn't even have the right to. Right, I think right. that was kind of the moment where I realized that, you know, I, I felt that I was 
powerless to do anything to change mm -hmm. that. Um, and now I'm starting, I'm seeing my family only, you know, for 24 hours every two weeks. And it was a little bit painful. Um, but it was, I, I also I have to admit, it was some sort of relief to know that I'm not there, not experiencing the, sh the, the day-to-day -day kind of um, situation. Mm -hmm. But I also felt guilty for not being there for my siblings who left for boarding schools themselves when they, you know, a few years after me. At that point, I realized that if I believe in something so badly, it will come true. Hmm. That was just my belief. If you, I, I kind of, and I don't know why, but I've, I, I told myself, I decide that I'm not going to be poor anymore, that I'm going to be a lot more than that. I'm going to make it on my own. and I'm going to be super successful. Um, when I was 15, I just, mm -hmm. and I said, if I believe it hard enough, it's going to, it's going to become reality. How did you even know that was a possibility as a reality though? I mean, did, do you, did you see something on, I don't know if you had television back then mm -hmm. or, or something, did you see someone that had money? Did you see the other side of that? Because that's where my curiosity comes from. If you only know what you know, right? Yeah. Like you said, how did you know that there was something else even to strive for? Well, I knew that there were, you know, rich people in the world. Um, I didn't mm -hmm. really know what they were doing. How did they make money? I just knew that I'm going to be successful on, on my own. Mm -hmm. I didn't really quite know it would be through a certain, you know, way. Um, mm -hmm. This vision became very clear later on. When I was 18, I graduated from high school and uh, I met this guy and a year later we were married. Actually, his family, um, his sister was married to someone that was very active in real estate and mm. he worked for this guy that until today, he's very, very successful. He was an Israeli that moved to the U.S. and started buying, uh, I think it was garages or something small and grew from there and today he's a super successful guy and I don't think he knows that I exist but he has such a huge impact on my life because when I was 19 and I realized okay I need to shape my life to do something um to grow to be successful because I heard so many stories about him and what he was doing mm -hmm. I knew that at some point it will be my success is going to be related to real estate, but I still wasn't sure how am I going to do it. And I thought by getting married so early, um, that was kind of my escape from going back home after high school. Sure. But things were actually worse. I thought I was making a, a, a progress, but I was actually going backwards because um, right. apparently the guy that I married to, um, and it took me years to discover that uh, he had gambling problems and mm. A lot of other problems. He couldn't keep a job for more than a few months. And um, I was still determined. I, det I was determined at that point to go to college and get a degree. And I was working three jobs. And um, I would. I remember going home, going back home at 6 p.m. And he would still be asleep because that was his afternoon nap or whatever. I try to, you know, I remember standing there in front of the bed and kicking him and the what are you doing? Like, why aren't you out there looking for a job? And he would just say, just leave me alone. Uh, he was very depressed and it made everything hard for him. He was depressed because he couldn't get a job and he couldn't mm, get a job sure. because he was out there gambling all day, gambling. Right. lost all of his money. And it, it, it was hard. <clears throat> At that point, I thought that if you love someone, that's going to be enough. And it's not. <laughs> it's, I think we all grow up with that yeah. fantasy. Thank you, Disney, uh, yeah. <laughs> for implanting that love conquers all. Exactly. Uh, but lucky for most people, they find that out before they get married. And I right. I had the painful pleasure of finding it <laughs> after I got married. Um, right. and, and religion played a huge role in it because my parents are very religious. And sure. you can't date someone for long without without getting married. And I felt the pressure. So that's why that was the second reason I, you know, why I got married uh, so young. And um, at some point, so, you know, I worked really hard. It took me two years to get into college. Um, it was very competitive. Uh, and I, I decided to become a lawyer and focus on real estate law. And, and that's what I did. So why law though? Like, why do you, 
we'll, we'll put you down that route. Um, I think when I was back in um, in high school, there were people started to call me the judge because or the lawyer because I think part of my personality was, you know, I was fighting for the rights of the students. So huh. as a religious group, we couldn't, you know, it was a religious boarding school. Girls in Israel are not allowed to walk to to wear pants, only long skirts. And I fought to change that so they can actually wear pants. And it was a long fight, but at the end they caved in and we were allowed after a certain hour. And that was unheard of, unheard right. of, because if you're wearing pants, it means that you're not relig religious. So it's kind of a, wow. yeah, so... Or fighting to get um, phones into boarding school because we were not allowed to bring phones, so people would hide their cell phones. Um, back in the days, where cell phones in 1999 and 2000, when cell phones were, were huge, it was like in the, it was the size of refrigerators. Uh, <laughs> for as large as they were, they didn't do very much. Yes, that's true. But they did a lot for you know kids who were all in the same place and. You know, sure, wanted to sure. kind of communicate with the outside world. Um, and because I was fighting for students' rights and, you know, I, 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 for me, becoming a lawyer was pretty kind of natural. And I was curious to know about the legal world. And I saw there, that I thought there was a lot of power in, in going there. And, I, and I, I, you know, I thought, okay, I can become a lawyer. I can work on real estate deals. And I'm not even sure if I knew exactly how I would do it, but that was kind of the path. And I, Lawyers were doing very well, you know, sure, around me. Sure. So I thought that that's a good path. Um, and um, as I said, it took me two years to to get to law school. I was, you know, working on my SATs and recommendations and everything. And I got in. I remember uh, driving outside before I applied. I was driving outside the university, and um, I was with my sister. We were driving, and I told her. I pointed out. On that, in the the building, I said, "You see here, this is where all the extremely smart people go to." And I didn't even think that I would get in. It was such a long shot, and I decided to submit my application anyways, even though, according to their, so they in Israel, they all the universities publish this um, kind of not instructions, but kind of the grid of who can get into what degree based on it's solely based on the the, the grades that they have from the high school mm -hmm. diploma in combination with the SAT. And I was not there to get to law school. That was so competitive. I was not there. And I still, and I said, you know what? I'm going to try it because why not? And, and this team has been following me until today where I see a lot of people today. Um, they say, you know, we're, we can't do that. We're not going to get in. We're not going to be able to do that. They don't even try. And I always, always try. And guess what? 80% of the time, and I'm not exaggerating, I make it. So I was like, you know what? They say I can't get in. I'm just going to try. And I got in. I actually graduated in four years. I had two degrees, bachelor and master's. It was kind of an accelerated program for uh, sure, outstanding sure. students. And I was so happy. Finally, I have my degree. I had my ticket out. And back home, unfortunately, I had someone that I had to take care of because financially he was not providing and um at some point when I discovered that he was gambling I said you know what um and I you know we, we have we have to do something because you got to get a decent job you have to stop gambling and we also need to go to marriage counseling because this is not working um right there was there was um, a lot of tension. Right. But instead of going into that, Ellie, let me ask you this, though. Like, how, I mean, obviously, you went through school. Law school is no joke, right, mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. Yeah. Right? There's a lot of studying. There's a lot of reading. There's a lot of focus, a lot of, how, how were you able to put aside your personal struggles, right, at home uh, with your husband, you know, with, with your husband at the time and still really stay focused? on that, right? Like, if you remember that time, how were you able to do that and still make it through? I was so focused. I was so obsessed with success because I knew that that was my ticket out. Um, the, the moment I got into my car and drove to class, the moment I got, I was still kind of in my own head. The moment I walked mm -hmm. in campus, I was a different person. 
There's different people were around me. The vibe was different. The energy was different. And when I got home, I handled with whatever was happening at home. Mm. And it was kind of two worlds that didn't really collide. And I think that was also the main reason why it didn't work at the end. Mm -hmm. We were kind of right. growing in two very, very different ways. Um, it was hard to bridge the gap. I, you know, I, I was exposed to very, very different experiences, experiences that he had. And I think he was still stepping in this, like standing still and, and kind of stuck in the same sure. place. Sure. So what caused you to stay so long with him? I wanted to leave at some point. I think it was the six, six or seven years after we got married and, um, I begged him to go to marriage counseling and deal. He had a lot of anger issues and I said, you need anger management, you know, therapy. And he refused because he didn't, re he refused to realize that something was wrong with him. Um, I should have left him th right there and then, but he wanted to succeed so much also, but he didn't know how. And it was really frustrating for him, which is why he went to gambling because he thought I'm going to make gonna make it you know a quick kind of win and become rich sure, by sure. hitting i don't know it's just it's not how it works right um <laughs> and um i wanted to leave him and then you know at some point he said you know what i'm not gonna gamble again and he promised me and i believed him and then one day i was driving in my car and uh kind of old beat up car i saw him in this little kind of a small gambling shop Mm -hmm. I understood that he was lying all those months. When he got home, I told him, you know what, this, it's over. 15 minutes later, he was on the floor, wasn't able to breathe. And um, he kept saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And later we, we realized that his fear, I guess, of maybe also of losing money, but I think also the fear of um, the separation it started this whole cycle of panic attacks, very severe panic attacks where he was struggling sure. for, for air and um, I, I couldn't leave him. It was, you know, I saw someone struggling and, you know, scared and in a real, really bad shape. And I spent another year running around from one doctor to another all across you know israel um trying to heal him you know psychologists and therapists and all kinds of um and we spent a lot of money we didn't have on right. the therapists and um after a year he got better and throughout this year it was kind of a honeymoon he was so sweet so considerate Try actually. I don't remember if he actually managed to get a, a job or was got fired in the process. But right. after he got better, he actually kind of it's like someone hit. You know, it's kind of a switch that went off, and he got back to become uh, verbally not so uh, gentle like he mm -hmm. was before. And at that point, you know, I realized. Okay, he's strong enough to be on his own. Um, I, I want out. And right. he wanted to go to for a trip, for a family uh, bar mitzvah in the U.S., actually. And I told him, our marriage is falling apart. You have to stay here and work on, because I, I was still willing to give one last chance, one more chance, if, he's, if we can just go to someone and, and, and get help. And he stood by the door and he had his bag with him. And I, I've been begging him not only when before he just left. The, it was like an entire two weeks of begging not to go there because our marriage is falling apart. And I remember he stood there and he looked he looked at me and he said, "You're never going to leave me because you're gonna hmm. you're gonna be all alone, wow. and nobody is going to end up with you because nobody can stand you as as a partner." And hmm. um, something that he has been saying for. The nine years that I was married, yeah, yeah, and I believed in, I believed him, because you know I was nineteen when I got married. What do I know? That was my first sure, relationship, sure. Um, and I was so scared all those years. That's why I didn't leave him. I was so scared to be on my own, to be alone. That when he, at some point, when he got 
really, really bad. And I used to go to bed crying every night. And I'm not a weak person. I'm not a no, super right. touchy, whatever. And I was still, it was still hard for me. And um, until some point I, I woke up and I said, you know what? I prefer to be alone than to be in this reality. Um, and I remember every time he used to hurt me, um, I, not physically, but when he, he's, I kind of imagine, I read a book about the power of the mind and I used to imagine mm -hmm. bricks, like I'm building a wall. So every time he would do that, I would disconnect and just build this, imagine building walls and like building a wall to protect myself from whatever was happening because sure. I couldn't take it anymore, you know, emotionally. And until one day I woke up and I didn't really love him anymore. Um, I guess the wall was was pretty solid. Yeah, yeah pretty strong. And yeah. And, solid, and, right? and I was still willing to work on it. But when he walked out the door and I said, and he said, you're never going to leave me. And I said, yes, I will. And if you're going out this door, you're not going to have a, a home to go back to. And that's what happened. Yeah. Um, he walked out the door. He made his choice. And he didn't think that I would leave him. A year before actually that happened, something happened that also contributed to my decision. I, um, it was the first week of... of um, my work as a lawyer and I was super excited to, to go work. You know, that was my dream. I was finally, I was wearing, you know, a suit and high heels. And I was, you know, I started my career as a lawyer and actually it happened two years before I got divorced. Um, mm -hmm. And I was sitting there and I was reviewing contracts, working on real estate deals. And I was, that was, you know, very exciting for me. It was one of the top 20 law firms in Israel, super competitive, uh, you know, uh, position. And I managed to get in and two weeks after I, a week or two weeks after I started working there, I noticed that the lines on the screen are not really straight. I'm looking at a word doc, but the edges, the lines, the edges right. are kind of right. wavy. And that was strange. Uh, I went to my friends and I said, Hey, you know what? I don't see very, I don't see very well. I mean, the lines are not straight. And they said, uh, I remember one girl told me, oh, yeah, that's, um, uh, you have mig migraine. And I was I never, I don't have migraines. And my head doesn't hurt. She said, yeah, it's probably right. a new type of migraine. And I thought that was the <laughs> dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> right, um, right. And I knew something was wrong. So I made an appointment the next morning. And that was a battle because there was no, no um, eye doctor available for two weeks. And I screamed on the poor girl that, that that was on the other you know side of the phone and she said there's only I can book you you know two weeks from now and I screamed so loud I I said I'm gonna sue you I something is wrong something is happening I need to see someone ASAP and I don't usually behave like that but I was so scared because I something told me inside that that this is sure, not sure it shouldn't be you know I, you should really fight to get an appointment um if something was wrong and I got an appointment the next morning and the doctor was looking into my eye. I, have, I, had, I didn't have any pain, but I, I wasn't seeing clearly. I wasn't sure what was going on. And he looked at me and it was kind of silence. And then he said, you have a very rare eye disease. You have to go to the ER right now. And I started to get scared of what's going on. And he told me this eye disease, the name was, was PIC, P-I-C. I didn't even know what it was. Actually, most yeah. eye doctors don't know what it is because it's so rare. They need to wow. Google it every time I meet a new doctor or consult with someone else with an expert because they haven't heard of it. I went to the ER and long story short, I was told that I had this rare eye disease where I, I don't know how if I want to get into a lot of details because on one hand, it's fascinating for a lot of people who don't know about it, but it's really, right. it can be a little gross. So apparently some blood vessels started to grow. Out of nowhere, your, like your cornea, or like yeah, yeah, and the actually in the retina, kind of in the back. Oh, okay. And Got it. Be, they started to grow. They shouldn't. Uh, just imagine you have extra veins in your hand that start to grow. I don't know what caused it, because they were not supposed to be there. The blood that was in in there started to uh, to kind of. Um, I, I was kind of bleeding, 
and that's from from those blood vessels and right. that's why i couldn't see well because it was i had liquid in my eye mm. so it's like seen through yeah water. Through water exactly right so if you touch the water everything is wavy now try to read right. something or see something underneath it it's really hard and uh, i started to get that that was the first day that i got an, a shot in my eye and uh I was using medication um, uh, that was pretty strong. I, I had to take um, prednisone, which is uh, it's it's really it's a it's a tough medication. Right, right. And it kind of s screwed up my kind of my system in a way. I would have so I experienced uh, hat flashes. So I know what women in their 50s or 60s are going through it's, <laughs> through menopause, it's right? terrible it's like heat coming yeah. out of you in, from the inside of your skull from your head it's unbelievable oh, wow. um it's like hunger in a way and i'm not a big girl but it's hunger that if you don't eat you're gonna throw up because you're so hungry um oh wow and i had to deal with all that and um my partner was not there for me mm. um i would go i would still go to work I, so i would get it was a series of you know eye injections and then they patched my eye and i would drive like that to work because i didn't want to miss work hopefully no cop you know nobody saw me because my my eye my eye was was it was one eye so i was using the other one that was good right and the doctor told me you need to rest you know not to get we you can't get any you know anything into my, your eye you need to keep it sterile and i thought the most sterile environment that I know is my office. I need to be there. We're working on a huge deal. It's like <laughs> right. $50 million deal. Right. I need to be there. And I would drive like this. And uh, I was on my own. He, mm. he didn't know how to deal with it. And then one, a few years later, when I decided to walk, you know, to end the marriage, when he walked out of the door, that's where... Where and when our, our marriage ended. Right. Well, yeah, th there was a lot of things leading up yeah. <laughs> to e the marriage ending. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty clear at this point. Yeah. But I admire your your courage now. To, I don't know if you've told this story. You know, this is the first time I've heard you tell this story. I don't know if anybody knows this story. And for you to, really. you know, eventually put this on a podcast uh, and reveal to, you know, the world your entire story. I admire your courage because for the people who are really listening, right? And not allowing maybe their own personal religious or own upbringing biases to get in the way. I think your, your, your story is really powerful. You know, what I'm hearing is that through the midst of all this chaos, I mean, from the point in your childhood up to this point, you know, going through the marriage, look at what you're able to accomplish and look at the mindset that you developed during that period of time to continue to push through right and be obsessed with a vision to get your degree to the, end up working at a law firm and through the midst mm -hmm. of your disease and going through this experience to continue to want to go to work and not miss that's that's dedication and then and then and then we have the latter half of your story which is probably going to be much more much more up <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but yeah but the thing is that yeah. when you're in in a tough situation you can occupy your mind with with you can have one mindset you can have two and i actually didn't when i was there I, I didn't feel that it was tough i didn't feel you know yeah i felt the struggle but i didn't feel oh my god my life sucks uh, this is difficult i can't do it anymore it's because i was my mindset was so focused on success on mm -hmm. fulfilling you know my my abilities myself and and getting to a place where where it's it's different and it's in that really helped me cope with a lot of things because I didn't feel that it was hard, actually. Yeah. It didn't feel yeah. hard at any point. It didn't feel extremely hard. After my divorce, um, it was, you know, I, I, so I got divorced. I healed from my mysterious eye disease. I kind of looked at my, my life and I realized, you know, it kind of, the, the whole disease situation helped me kind of pause and say, okay, why don't you look at your life? Really look at your life. Are you happy? Is this what you want? And I realized that being alone was definitely something that I wanted if it meant, you know, to be in a bad relationship. 
And I also realized that I wasn't really happy working as a lawyer. It wasn't because I, I was I was sitting there and negotiating huge deals, but I was always, always, I want to be on the other side of the table. I wanted right. to be my client who, and they came back telling me how they were looking for lands in Eastern Europe and it was a huge developer and uh, how they raise capital and how they build apartment buildings and office spaces. And, and I was, I was so drawn to that part of business. It, it was, mm -hmm. it was where decision were made. And um, I realized, Hey, I'm not really happy as a lawyer. Um, I want to do, I want to take a more active part because now when I came out of the struggle phase in my life, I really have, now I had the time and the mental capacity to see, oh, am I happy? What do I really want to do? Right, right. Um, You'd have all these distractions. Exactly. Uh, taking up your energy and time. Yeah. That you I'm no couldn't, couldn't afford to sit back and go, am I happy? You're like, you had to think about, am I, how am I going to survive this next day? Exactly. So shift from survival mode to fulfillment mode. I quit my job. I actually didn't have a new job. Right. I just quit my job because <laughs> I was determined. I said, hey, you're going to find what you want. You shouldn't be in a situation. I'm, I was done being in a situation where I was not happy. I've done that for, for almost a decade. I'm not doing it anymore. Right. And money was tight because I didn't have a job, but I was so determined to be happy. Several days after, yeah, about a week after I, I um, quit my job, a friend of mine called and said, hey, uh, she was also a lawyer. All my friends were lawyers at that sure, point. Sure. And she, you guys hang out together, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she said, hey, Ellie, um, I, we have a, a, um, a client and he's looking for a project manager, someone with um, experience in, in law and real estate. Are you interested? And I said, yes, of course I'm interested. And that's how, that's how I made my shift from the legal world to uh, the business world. Um, and I worked, um, I worked in real estate as a project manager. Um, later, the company was sold and then I moved to the parent company and I worked as a property manager. And I was, I was a lot happier because I was doing things that were, that were, I, I liked the energy. I liked, you know, being there and talking to tenants and, and looking at, uh, even looking at contracts in that, you know, um, sure. concept was, was great. And, and at some point, I think it's kind of a theme in my life where I, I, I get, I set up a goal, I get there. And then I, when I get there, I said, Hmm, that wasn't that hard. And, and what gets me excited is looking up and say, I actually want to, I actually want to get to that point. And it's kind right. of a huge mountain that does that never ends. And my head is always angled up upwards where I always look up and I said, Hey, what's the next goal? What's the next goal? And I get excitement from achieving the next goal. Sure, um, sure. And my next goal was actually to get an MBA and I was making decent money at that time. And this is still in Israel, this, right? I'm, yeah. Just, okay. still, in Israel. Is still in Israel. Still in okay. Israel. I'm working for, as a property manager for the largest energy company in Israel. Um, mm -hmm. We have over 300 gas stations across Israel. I have a pretty good position. I have a good relationship with the VP, the guy who manages the department. And he actually became my mentor. And he, mm -hmm. he used to, we used to, you know, um, sit and, and have a glass of wine and he used to always tell me you have to enjoy the the path you have to enjoy the process don't don't be overly focused on the end goal on the result right still right. trying to you know uh to implement it but it's really hard for me yeah uh, <laughs> yeah the, I, i've actually come into my own and that to my own career is like to learn to enjoy and have more fun along the way instead of being so narrowly yes. focused. It's great to have that, that, that vision and that focus, but sometimes, you know, especially achievers like you, you get so tunnel vision that like, there's so many other things happening around you that you could, you just let life go by and you kind of miss it, you know? Exactly. Uh, so yeah, that's cool. And it, but, right. but it's hard, right? It's hard to, how am I supposed to, enjoy the little things in life where the biggest thing in life is hasn't been achieved yet. Like I, I want to get there. So what excites me is, is things that are hard to, to achieve. 
So mm -hmm. I decided, okay, I'm going to do an MBA in the U.S. Um, I'm, I'm going to apply to Ivy League schools and, and see what happens. And I believed, I just, just like in back in boarding school, I just, I just told myself, yes, I'm going to live in the U.S. I'm going to get admitted to a, an Ivy League school and, or to a top school. And I believe that if I want it so badly, it will become my reality because we can shape. I don't believe in fate. I believe in, in, in Creation. exactly in creating our own path and shaping our reality. And, and I remember I, I, uh, I hired a guy to help me navigate through the whole application process. And he said, and, you know, I was also fascinated with technology and I thought, okay, I want to start, I want to become an entrepreneur at some point. I think MIT could be a good fit. And mm. he said, MIT would be a stretch. <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> I said, mm, I mean, I'm looking at your GMAT. It's, it's good score. It's higher than, but it's not 750 or 780. Like the people who get right. in. Yes. It's a stretch. And there's nothing like telling me I can't do something yeah, to yeah. get me excited. I said, okay, so let's do it. After explaining, you know, taking 15 minutes to explain to me why it would be a stretch. Um, he, you know, we, we started working and, um, long story short, I got in and that was, uh, I still remember when I got the call and they actually, they usually at MIT don't call people. Um, right. They, they the, the administ, the, so the office itself, they, I mean, they don't call people. They give the list to, um, students from the same country. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they make the calls and say, Hey, congratulations. And, but the lady that was interviewed me, you know, she was, I guess, I don't know, impressed or she liked me and she, she decided mm -hmm. to do it personally. And, um, not only I got in, I also got a scholarship. I remember when I called my advisor and I said, Hey, I got in. He was like, I don't believe this. And <laughs> I said, not only I got in, I, they gave me a scholarship. He said, What? That I, I don't, I, I remember he kept saying, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. I don't believe this because they're not, they usually don't give scholarships and not so, so generous like the one that I received. Wow. Yeah. And in this whole, you know, thing, everything that was happening in the background, um, about, and I'm, and I'm still in Israel when this lady calls and gives me the news nine months after I got divorced, I met someone. And uh, it was uh, Israel's Independence Day. It was a rooftop party in Tel Aviv. And uh, I went there with a friend. And we saw each other and we, we danced together and we started talking. And when he said that he graduated from Wharton, from me, because I was also applying to <laughs> Wharton at that time. Right, right, right. That was it. That's all I needed to hear. Oh, my right. God, a smart guy. And he, you know, went to Wharton. He's an accomplished guy. And. And that's the guy that I'm going to marry in, in two months. Congratulations, Thank you. by the way. This is a Cinderella story, you know, and uh, I, I look at your story in your life and, and I, I truly believe that life gives us the situations that we, the mysticism of life is so amazing, right? We never know why we have to experience what we have to experience. And I take a look at your childhood and your story there. And the reason why you never, the, the tough times that you went through, you were able to push is no one ever rewarded you for wallowing in your pain. Yeah. Right. You, you didn't have parents that emotionally or was capable of doing that, or even physically capable of doing that. And that actually taught you just to like, okay, I, I run into a problem or I run into a challenge and I just got to figure out how to get there instead of like, you know, wallowing it and, and that's the connection I, I'm making for your life, yeah. you know, and like the, the beauty of, of how life was able to give you some gifts that were in other people's eyes, like struggle. Yeah. I, right. But mm -hmm. were, were tools to, to teach you to, to go through a part of your life that was probably very difficult, even more difficult because now you were an adult, you know, working through it instead of being a kid. And, you know, I mean, the kid world, you have problems, but you, you don't really know you have problems. Exactly. And I, and I think but. you nailed it because that's, that's how I see the world. Um, I, I'm a problem solver. So mm -hmm. 
when there's a situation, I don't say, oh my God, I'm like, I don't dwell in my own or in, in when other people come to me with a certain problem, I listened to it and I said, okay, what can we do now to fix it? What's the mm. next step? What should we do? Um, Cause it doesn't make sense. I mean, I know it's hard for some people and it's kind of hard to control that part, but it doesn't, sure. Sure. it's not really helping. Um, and the, the same, so I'm also in the same place where, you know, I, I, I started Blue Lake Capital on buying multifamily properties okay. across the U S. So, um, not, you know, I live in California, so not, not here, unfortunately, because the market is not the right market for multifamily for you know, my, my strategy, at least that's exactly when I started a company, I said, okay, this is, I want, you know, to take the company to a certain place. What do I need to do? it's it's all about where you are right now and what you need or can't do to get to the next point in life. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even going to tell you how much, you know, where I want to take my company to. It has something to do with, with the B word. Uh, word so, right, uh, right. The B word. The B word, yeah. <laughs> what, what's his name uh, in the movie uh, Social Network? Mm -hmm. The guy that started Napster when he was talking to Zuckerberg. When he's like, you know what's cool? Millionaire, that's not cool. Being a billionaire, <laughs> that's cool. And so from that point on, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Being a millionaire today is like barely getting by. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. I can attest to that because I'm in an industry that serves millionaires and there's a lot of fear. I mean, if if you have two, three million dollars and, and you're in your 60s, you're not like super comfortable about life. I agree. Yeah. And you're actually living a lot more and you have a lot of fear about whether or not your money's going to last you. So, yeah, no, that's a great stretch. And so where are you at in the process of, of Blue Lake Capital now? I mean, you, you've gone through some rounds of funding and raising some capital. Yeah. So we're actually looking right now at our next deal um, and hopefully we'll be able to close soon. We're, we're looking at properties in, um, in Texas, Georgia, Florida, three markets that I love. And mm -hmm. um, I go out there, I mean, I'm, I'm out of state investor. So I go out there every once or twice a month, actually. And it's it's an exciting time. I think that, you know, right now, I mean, the, the market is competitive. And so sure, you either sure. can say, and I hear a lot of people around me that want to get into real estate, and they say, Oh, the market is so competitive, we don't know what to do, how to do it. And they just, most of them decide not to make the move. And I say, okay, this is a problem. The market is competitive. Then what do you do? What do you, you know, what are the steps that you can do to actually land a deal? Mm -hmm. And that's my approach. So I'm, I'm constantly, you know, I'm always, I'm, I'm thinking about ways to differentiate myself from others. Um, big part of it is relationships with apartment owners, with brokers, with investors, it's it's exciting. I mean, it's not. I do it for the money, and I don't do it for the money. So I do it for the money because yeah. obviously, you know, investors are out there and they bring their money, and we, in, together we invest in the deal. So it has to be about the money, about the returns. But I don't do it for for the money per se. Mm, it's the sure, excitement sure. of building something and growing it. That's what excites me. That's the next step in in that mountain that I told you that I keep looking up and okay, this is like. I get this, you know, I kind of, um, I mark a, a new, it's, it's kind of a, a new goal and, it, and mm -hmm. it seems and people around me and it's been like that my whole life. I set up a goal, people around me, you're crazy. You can't do it. It's hard. You won't be able to do it. And I was like, oh, just watch me. And that right, excites right. me that the whole process of getting there and now this company, bringing this company to where I want to bring it, that's the next goal. So sure. for now it's the the first goal that I haven't, um, I haven't achieved yet because I'm still working on it. It's, it's a big mountain. Yes. It's a big mountain and only very few people can climb it. Yeah. And it's going to take years to get there, but I'm, yeah. I'm okay with that. It's, uh, you know, I think, um, I'm surrounding myself with, with people with the right experience and the right determination like I have. Mm -hmm. So that's um I, I think that's the right way to go about it. That's that's a good recipe. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if you want to share with it or reveal if it's too secret of a sauce on, on your real estate strategy, but you know, what, what are some of the things that you're looking at in the market that you're trying to get into that is going to maybe differentiate yourself or be able to win you that deal in a competitive market right now? Can you share with you, you know, just one or two ideas or strategies that, you know, Sure. That doesn't give away your the entire, you know, secret sauce. <laughs> sure. So I think um, when it comes to looking at a market, it's um, it's mainly and it's it's not a secret. It's it's uh, pretty basic. You look at the job growth uh, and the population mm. growth. These are the main two things. There are other things that I'm looking at, but I'm looking to see. I I go where the people go because that equals demand, right? Um, right. So that's part of it. Um, but I do try to get my hands on other materials that show that show what really what what's really going on. So it could be local forums where people say, "Hey, you know, some people are starting to move to a certain location, and it's not something that is available to um, investors usually. It's kind of very local forums where young people are talking among you know one another, like to give, for instance, um, advice on where to move. So mm-hmm. you can you know, reveal a lot of information of what's going on in the neighborhoods. But I also like to drive there and stop people in the streets and just chat with them hmm. and and ask, hey, what do you think about this neighborhood? And people would, they love talking about, you know, where they live and they'll tell you in this location, this is like a lot of young people are moving here or this is a bad area. Um, my, the connection with the locals, it's it's basically what's, what gives me insights that I think a lot of out, out of state investors or investors that, that are not local don't have. Right. Um, and when it comes to getting deals, a lot of it is is about relationships. So I'm actually going to start soon a meetup for um, apartment owners in the markets that I'm active in, and I'm going to bring mm. guest speakers to talk about um, ways to increase your NOI, your net operating income, uh, for instance. You know, this is something that most investors don't do. They don't create platforms for apartment owners because the goal is actually to get to to get to know them. And when someone wants to sell, you're going to be the first one they're going to call to get yeah, off market absolutely. deals. So another way is to text them. So I have access to CoStar, which has a lot of um information on apartment building owners and Mm -hmm. just call them directly, text them, send them letters, handwritten letters to say, Hey, I want to buy your building. So Mm -hmm. making everything that you can do to, to land a deal that is kind of outside of the market. So it's kind of very, you know, off market deal. So, so what you, which do you think is harder, uh, raising money or finding the deal? Finding the deal. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money out there a lot of available money from people who either done very well in a stock market recently. And I know, yeah. I know several people that made over 25% uh, returns on their money right. and people who actually don't like the, the fluctuations of the market and they want something a bit more stable. Mm-hmm. That that's the reason why there's a lot of money out there. And I have, you know, people reach out to me every week my website um, or link my LinkedIn profile and they say, hey, we have some money we want, you know, to deploy. We want to invest. Can we talk? So there's a lot of money out there. Um, it, it, it's it's not easy. I wouldn't say it, nothing is easy. Nothing that, that, that comes, you know, in, in this business, nothing is easy. But getting right. the deal is the hardest part because there's a lot of money. Then sure. a lot of people are chasing deals. And I see a lot of people buying deals with really low returns. Mm-hmm. So without getting too much technical, you know, I'm looking into 15 to 20% IRR internal rate of return. And the goal is to double investors' money in five years. So right. if someone wants to do that in 10 years, well, guess what? The deal is not that competitive. Or if they're looking at 11% IRR. So I, I have a team, they run the numbers. We're very conservative and... When we make, when we submit an offer, we see other people submitting offers that are a lot higher than ours. And I don't understand how they make any money. And right now, the cycle, we're in a great part of the cycle. A lot of people are making money, even if they overpaid for the property. 
uh, the occupancy is high. You have a lot of people, you know, 95, right. 98% of the building is occupied. But I always think what's going to happen a year, two years, three years from now, the cycle is going to end. The economy is going to shift. We don't know what's going to happen. And yeah. that's how I conduct my business. It's part of being a lawyer. You know, once a lawyer, always a lawyer. We always, sure. as a lawyer, sure. you're always trained. Contingencies, to, for sure. Exactly. To look at the worst case scenario. And yeah. what do, would you do then? Because you need to protect your client. So right. that's how I look at a deal. What's the worst thing that can happen? So when, when we run the numbers, we, we, we say, okay, what happens if we cannot increase rents at all? Flat rents, 0% increase, but expenses increase every year. Does the, still, the, right. does the deal still work? So if it does, then we'll move forward. Right. So right. a lot of deals we don't, we don't, you know, um, a lot of deals, most deals don't work. And when people buy deals that are just to get a deal, they're making a little bit of money now. I hope to, I, maybe it sounds bad, but I'm still in the active in the very, in very competitive markets uh, like Dallas or Atlanta, where I'm going to be there when the economy shifts and when those people were not, wouldn't be able to pay for the mortgage. I'm going to be there to, right. to get a good deal. Pick it up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where exponential growth happens yes. and wealth gets built is during downtimes. Exactly. That's, that's simply it. And I, I, I think your way of thinking is the, the sustainable way because we always got to prepare. We can't think about the rosy times. That's what got the financial crisis in trouble, right? Exactly. They're, they're packaging mortgage-backed securities <laughs> together, thinking that uh, values would never go down. Exactly. <laughs> Surprise. That's amazing. And we already see um, a slowdown in, in rent increases around the country. So that's, I think that's the first, and nobody can know. I mean, you can get a crystal ball at Amazon for $9.99, but nobody can right, know right. what's going to happen. But I think this is, what, it's, it's kind of, I think something is starting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I don't want to get too technical, but the cap rates are, they're not they're they're kind of low right now um mm -hmm. but i can i see that in several markets that the rent growth is slowly declining um and that's i think it's an indicator that something is is changing because rent because when, when people buy real estate they think okay rents are going to increase every year and that's going to increase my my income every year. And that means also when I'm going to sell it, I'm going to sell it for a much higher price than I bought it because the property is generating a lot more money. You can increase rents forever. At some point, people can pay for them for, for, for rent. You can afford it. Yeah, exactly. Right. It'll over surpass their income capability. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. Now, so I'm excited for you. Thank you. Ellie. Yeah, it's exciting. It's, um, this is uh, a great, I mean, it's, as I said, it's, uh, it's, my next goal and it's a big goal and i anticipate to get there in about 10 to no uh in 14 years I, 14 years wow. i calculated yeah the mit nerd that i am i calculated how many deals i can close in each year uh and what's the value of of each year and what will be the growth so it's going to take me about 14 14 and a half years to to get to where i want to get that's great you know, i mean if you're going to be a numbers person yeah <laughs> know the numbers for sure yeah so if you could leave you know people with a thought right that you want them to get in Carter out of your story mm -hmm. what do you think that would be never give up never ever don't let anyone including yourself tell you that you can't do something mm -hmm. because if you actually want something really badly it will happen if you keep telling yourself it's it's thought that creates reality. You keep telling yourself that you convince yourself that even if you don't believe in it at first, you'll mm -hmm. start to believe in it. And then you'll behave in a way that will get you to where you want to get. If you think you, you can do something, guess what? You wouldn't be able to do it because you're not right. many times you're not even right. going to try. Um, but even in the unlikely, if the likelihood of getting what you want is very low, still push and do it because look around you. The people who actually made it are the cr people who everyone thought they were crazy. What right. they were able to accomplish was 
you know, outstanding. And if they were in a different mindset, the world would be very different today. Absolutely. So just, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The only guaranteed way to fail is to quit. Exactly. Right. Exactly. A lot of people don't even start. All right. Exactly right. So that's that's amazing. Congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, in your coming uh, marriage. Thank you. And I wish you all the best there. And thanks for you know allowing me to kind of go on your story. And I think a lot of people are going to get some value out of this, especially it ended up being, uh, I thought this was going to be more like, you know, real estate related, but it really ended up being about like life and relationships and person, not only with another person, but ourselves and, you know, and the, and the story of, of overcoming, you know, tremendous amounts of struggle, even though you didn't seem like it was struggle, but, you know, looking back, I'm like, man, that's, yeah, there were some rough times there. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I am where I am right now and I have a, a lot of passion towards real estate and um, my life story is my why. That's why I mm. do this. Um, so it's not a hardcore conversation about real estate, but, but right. that's, these are the steps. I mean, this is what, uh, you know, the kind of the, the steps along the way that I took to get to where I am today. And it took me time to realize that, Hey, I want real estate and, and you know, exactly what I want to do. It takes time, but you know, thankfully I have a very, very supportive partner and he supports in the most ridiculous, you know, goals <laughs> I, ha I have or ideas. Right. It's, it changed, it changed my life in a way that, um, yeah. you know, have that support that I never had before. Right. I believe in myself even more and I can't wait to get to where I want to get to in, 15, in 14, 15 years so I can actually mark the next, uh, you know, the next goal. So, And so that's the beauty that uh, you and your husband are going to be able to experience together as well. Yeah. As that. If I had to go through everything I went through um, to appreciate what a, you know, good relationship is, it, it was all worth it.